Hello everyone, how's it going? Uh, I'm stuck here in my office. It's raining outside. Not complaining, the garden needs it. But uh, I'd rather be outside, but this will be fine. I've got a quick little lecture that I wanted to talk to you about um, having to do with the origin of species. So we spent a lot of time now talking about uh, evolution and natural selection and, and that process. And ultimately, we're trying to explain the diversity that we see in modern times. You know, where, from where do we get all these species? And so an important consideration is, well, how does a new species form? We've talked about what species are, but how do you get a new species? And so we're going to talk about that briefly. And so this is an idea that, you know, started, of course, with Darwin, and he realized it was an important idea. He found all these different species on the Galapagos. But how do those new species arise, right? Natural selection is a pretty simple idea when you think about it. And it's pretty straightforward. But how can you then lead to all the, the millions and millions of different species that we see on Earth and the millions of species that we see in the fossil record that have already existed, right? Um, and so that's what we need to kind of reconcile. And so we want to talk about um, first species isolating mechanisms. You know, what keeps different species from interbreeding. And then we'll talk a little bit about how species form. And so again, we've defined species as two organisms that cannot interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. So if you cannot produce viable and fertile offspring, then those organisms are different species. And so there's a term that we use called uh, reproductive isolation, or those two species are reproductively isolated. And so what we want to talk about is specifically what can cause two species to be reproductively isolated. And there are several ways that we can organize this and talk about this, and there are a lot of these, and we're just going to again, kind of take the 10,000 foot view here. But basically, you can break them down into pre-mating isolating mechanisms and post-mating isolating, isolating mechanisms. So these two uh, types of isolating mechanisms are pretty much what they sound like, right? Anything that stops two different species from attempting to mate, that's a pre-mating reproductive isolating mechanism. And so the two things don't even try. And so, for example, here we've got two different species. Why don't they even try to mate? What is the pre-mating isolating barrier? Well, of course, they are just such completely different organisms. You know, the parts don't match up, right? And they recognize they don't even appear to be uh, anything similar. So that, you know, it, it's kind of a silly question, but it's meant to be a silly question, right? Like there's just things that don't match up. And so clearly, these are kept separate species because they never try to reproduce. But what about these species? These species are a little bit more similar, right? But they're still two different fish species. And so what keeps the two of these species from mating? Because, you know, they're found in the same environment, but they don't really mate with one another. Although they look very similar and they have all the same uh, uh, sexual organs and they reproduce in the same manner, right? Why don't they reproduce? Well, one reason is that little red tab there. So on the top picture, you've got a bluegill and on the bottom picture, you've got a red ear and they're both in the genus Lipomus. So they're closely related, but they tend not to interbreed. Now, um, so Roy Heidinger, the guy I got my PhD with, he did a little experiment where he had some ponds, and in some of the ponds, he would put both of these species, just as they are, and let them reproduce, and then drained the ponds and looked at the young of the year, looked at the baby fish that were produced. And so you'd put these two species in the pond, and then they'd reproduce, and you'd drain it, and you would get either bluegill or red ear as babies, right? So the adults were 
mating within their species. They were not crossing. Um, they were not even trying to mate, right? It's pre-mating reproductive uh, isolation. He then took the red ear and took a pair of fingernail clippers and just cut that little red tab off. You know, if there's no nerves there. There's nothing there. Just remove that little red tab and did the same thing. Put them both in a pond, let them reproduce, drained the pond, and looked at the offspring. And in that situation, you found a lot more hybrids. And so that suggests that that little red tab is what they're using to identify each other. And so the bluegills see that red tab and say, oh, it's a different species. I'm not going to breed with them. And the red ears are looking for other species that have the red tab, and they're going to breed with them. Um, and so that's what keeps them from breeding with each other. You know, it's, it's a visual identification. Once you removed that visual identification, then they couldn't, uh, uh, you know, then they, they would breed with each other. So that's pre-mating. Uh, here's a couple of birds, and we've already said these are different species. In a different lecture, well, what keeps them from mating with one another? And again, I'm speculating here, but probably they have different songs, right? The males use a song to attract a female. And if you don't have the correct song, then the female won't breed with you. And so the Western meadowlarks have a, so a certain song and the Eastern meadowlarks have a certain song. And so that keeps them from even trying to mate because the song is different. Pre-mating, isolating barrier. Here's a couple more fish again. These are crappie. They're in the genus Pomoxis. Uh, you got a black crappie on the bottom left and a white crappie on the upper right. What keeps them from mating? Well, there could be several things, um, but one of the biggies is they spawn at different temperatures. <clears throat> and so the black crappie spawn in a little bit cooler water. So the black crappie come into the shoreline and spawn and then as the water warms up, they finish spawning and move off. And then the white crappie move in and they spawn at a warmer temperature. And so, um, again, if you put these two together in a lab or you mix the sperm and the eggs, you'll get viable, fertile offspring. But it doesn't happen in nature because of this pre-mating, isolating barrier. So just there's all kinds of things that keep species from mating with each other. Now, anything that stops production of a viable fertile offspring after mating, that of course would be a post-mating isolating mechanism. So here we do have mating, but you still don't get a viable fertile offspring. Okay, what keeps these two species from producing viable fertile offspring? Obviously there's mating going on here, but you don't expect a viable fertile offspring. Well, why not? Because the, the gametes don't match up. You know, the sperm and the egg probably don't even fuse because they're, you know, they're so incompatible and the anatomy is so incompatible. And so although mating takes place, no zygote is formed, uh, uh, no viable fertile offspring is formed. And so just, you know, the, the um, anatomy or and or physiology keeps those gametes from uniting. Well, here we have an example, again, of where two species, um, you know, the, the gametes can unite and it does form a zygote and that zygote is viable, right? And so you can breed a donkey and a horse and you get a mule and the mule is healthy and lives and can live for a long time, but the mule is not fertile, right? It's, it's sterile. And so what is it uh, that keeps these two from producing a fertile viable offspring, it's the chromosomes. Um, and so you've got a different chromosome number in the donkey and in the horse. And so when they come together, the offspring has 63 chromosomes. And so you've got an odd number of chromosomes. And so if you do, you know, work through meiosis, if you've got an odd number of chromosomes, you can see that the chromosomes are not going to be partitioned up equally. And so every sperm and every egg has like a, you know, a, a funny number of chromosomes, but it's probably, you know, a mixture of 
different chromosomes, different positions. And so the chromosomes are just so um, screwed up in meiosis that the gametes can't function. And so although you've got a viable offspring, it can't produce gametes, you know, or proper gametes. And so it's fertile. And so that's a post-mating isolating barrier. Another example, um, you know, many of our varieties of corn or other vegetables or a lot of crops, they're hybrids. And because you get something called hybrid vigor, you get a mixing of the alleles. And so the offspring between the two species, you know, grows very well and produces very big ears. And that's advantageous, right? But if you take those uh, uh, corn kernels from this hybrid corn and you plant them, they won't grow. They won't grow as well as either of the parents. And, um, and again, it's probably because of mismatches of chromosomes. And so you can produce a viable offspring that grows very well and produces very big ears of corn, which is sort of what you want if you're a farmer. Excuse me. But then those are not fertile. They don't grow as well. And so that's, again, something that keeps these species from interbreeding but it's post-mating. Um, back to our crappie again. We can see another example, a similar example in these crappie. Not only do they spawn at different temperatures, um, which is a pre-mating isolating barrier, but also if they do happen to spawn, the F1 generation is viable and fertile. And so they can produce fertile offspring. But if those F1s breed with each other, the F2 generation is often weak. And so again, there's some sort of chromosomal incompatibility that's going on here that keeps them from producing viable fertile offspring and helps to isolate the species. But in this example, it's a post-mating barrier. Okay, so that's just an idea of how we can kind of keep species apart. So now let's talk about how do we get these new species. And again, so there's a lot of different ways. There's a lot we could talk about. We're just taking the 10,000 foot view here. Um, but basically, the, the idea is you have to have a small group that gets genetically split off from a larger group. That's how new species evolve. And so when we talk about um, you know, two species that have a common ancestor, if you go back far enough, you've got a population of a different species that looks kind of like both of the, the modern species. And then we said that that common ancestor, that population gets split. Well, you get a group that splits off and it's genetically uh, isolated, then that will form a new species. And you get another group that splits off and becomes genetically isolated and that will form a new species. And that's kind of the, the main goal here. Well, there's a, several ways that we can genetically isolate that smaller group. And the two broad types we're going to talk about are allopatric and sympatric speciation. So let's talk about just this concept of, uh, again, a species and what holds a species together and how does this work in, in real life. And so this is just an example of a species spread across an area, okay? And so this could be animals or plants or whatever. And the maroon circles represent populations of the species. So again, let's remind ourselves, what is a population? A population is a group of individuals of the same species that interact in the same area. And so if you think about, you know, the population of Murray, Kentucky, or the population of Paducah, Kentucky, right? You're talking about the same species. You're, you know, when we talk about it in that way, we're talking about humans, right? We're the same species, but, you know, the population of Murray is in one area and interacts together, and the population of Paducah is in one area and interacts together. That's one way to think of a population. Another way to think of a population is a group of potentially interbreeding individuals that share a common gene pool. And so again, they're all the same species, so that means that they can potentially interbreed. But the population is a group that um, is more likely to interbreed, you know, because they're in the same area. 
And because of this, they share a common gene pool, meaning that you've got individuals in this population that are interbreeding and are exchanging alleles, and those alleles get passed around the population. So, you know, a population is a subset of a species, right? Now, the arrows that are connecting each of these populations represent gene flow. And we haven't talked about gene flow. What is gene flow? Gene flow occurs when individuals from one population breed with individuals from another population. And so you have immigration and emigration and you have individuals that go to a different population. And so, you know, they're taking their alleles, which come from one population, and they're moving those alleles to a different population. So that's where the genes are flowing between the populations, right? So within the population, you're exchanging alleles, and then between population, you have gene flow, where you're also exchanging those alleles. And that gene flow connects all those populations, and this is what binds the species together. Because remember, to be considered the same species, you have to be able to interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. And so by having individuals that hop between populations, that still, they're still able to interbreed, so that still means they're all the same species. And so, again, the point here is that a species in, in um, nature isn't this big, just homogenous group, and they're all sharing their DNA. It's discrete, smaller populations that are sharing their DNA with the occasional exchange of DNA between those populations. So that's how they exist in real life. Now, why can those genes flow between populations? Again, they're all the same species. So by definition, they can interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. And so that's why you're able to have genes hopping between these populations. But what happens if gene flow stops? And so if gene flow stops to one of the populations, that is how you can get a new species. That, new, that population is now genetically isolated, and that population can possibly become a new species. It doesn't guarantee it, but this is how new species are formed. You have that population that no longer has gene flow with the other populations. And so in this example, you see the, the, the populations that are circled they still have gene flow. They're still exchanging DNA. They're still bound together. They're still the same species. But the green population in the lower right is isolated. And so because it's isolated, it will evolve separately. And given enough time, it will change so much and the, the DNA of that population will change so much that it can no longer breed with the other populations. And so if it's isolated long enough, and if the DNA changes long enough, and then those individuals do come back together somehow, now they can't reproduce because their DNA has diverged so much. That means you've got a new species, right? Because they can no longer in interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. And so we could talk all day about, well, why is it? Why does that one population change genetically? And there's lots of reasons. Um, and again, we're just kind of taking the 10,000 foot view, but you know, first off populations are small, you know, they're a subset of the species. So a population is small relative to the rest of the species. And in small populations, genetic changes happen quickly. And so at times we talk about things like genetic drift, that is much more pronounced in a small population. Genetic drift is just DNA that changes at random. It's, it's not selection. It's just uh, the, the random fusion of gametes means that sometimes some alleles just disappear randomly. And that's genetic drift, but that becomes much, much more common and much more uh, of a factor in a small population. And these isolated populations are small. Also, you know, I drew this picture the way I did on purpose. You know, it's, it's the population that's out at the edge of the species range. It's at the extreme of the original range. And so all these populations exist in a landscape, in a habitat, right? But then eventually they don't 
exist anywhere beyond that. Think of, uh, you know, like a, a, a oak trees that live here in Kentucky, and they're spread all around the Midwest. But if you go far enough north, you don't see those oak trees anymore. If you go far enough south, you don't see those oak trees anymore because the environment is not suitable. And so it, somewhere there's sort of an edge of the range. Well, why is that edge there? Because the, in, you know, it's the extreme of the habitat. It's the extreme that that species can tolerate. So you're in an extreme environment out here on the edge. And so the environment is probably quite a bit different than in the main part where the rest of the species are. So if you've got a, a different environment, then natural selection is going to act differently. And so you're going to evolve for that different environment relative to the rest of the species. Finally, any new mutations that show up in either the, the isolated group or the original species, mutations happen at random, but since they're not exchanging DNA, those mutations will stay within each particular subgroup. And so consequently, that isolated population can change genetically very quickly and become very different than the original group. Now, there's also some other mechanisms that are going on here. So you can imagine that once this starts, that isolated population becomes genetically different, right? And so if members from the isolated population interact with some of the original species, they might still be able to interbreed, right? They, the, the population that's speciating has not changed very much, but it has changed. And so when the original species and the new individuals come together, they can still interbreed. But because that new group has diverged, now the DNA, although compatible, it's not as compatible. And so the offspring are not very viable. They're viable and they're fertile, but they're not as good as before because that one group is genetically diverging. Consequently, um, you know, any member of the original species, the maroon circles here, they have a, you know, they're motivated to not breed with that new species. If you breed with that new group, it's not quite a species yet, but it's different enough DNA wise. Your offspring are probably not going to be very viable. And so you're better off just sticking with the other species which means that that isolated group is even more isolated now, which means it's going to diverge even a little bit more, which means that now it's even a worse idea for the original species to breed with that new isolated species because their DNA is a little bit more different and your offspring are going to be a little bit more worse off. So you're better off picking members of the original species, right? And, and not breeding with that, that new species which means that that new group is even more genetically isolated, which means that they become even more different, and so on and so on. And that's what we call a positive feedback loop, is that, that the, the groups, once they start to diverge, then they're pushed to diverge even stronger. And so once this divergence starts, then it's hard to stop, and then you end up with two very different groups genetically, now you've got a different species. Okay, so what we've just described is an example of allopatric speciation. Allopatric means in a different place. And the other type of speciation we talked about was sympatric. And sim means similar, same. And so sympatric speciation is when the species pops up in the same place. And so here's just another example where you've got, you know, a pond with all one species of fish. And if the water levels dropped so that the it's split into two populations that are physically separate from each other, they're in a different place on the left here, that's allopatric speciation. But it's also possible that the water levels don't change and the fish are not isolated from each other, yet you still get a new species that forms. And so they're in the same place and you still get speciation. That's sympatric speciation. And so, you know, allopatric speciation is probably more common 
And you've got tons and tons and tons of examples of this. For example, if you look at the Grand Canyon, on either side of the Grand Canyon, you have a different species of ground squirrel. They're very similar, but they're different species. Well, you can imagine that back when, before the, ground, the Grand Canyon formed, you had a population of a type of squirrel. And as the Grand Canyon started to form, then that population got split in two and it got harder and harder for them to interact and to interbreed. And so each diverged genetically. And then as the Grand Canyon formed, it got even harder and harder and they, and they diverged more and more. And now you have two different species because they were in different places. Another good example is uh, the Isthmus of Panama, which formed about 3 million years ago when water levels began to fall. And so then, you know, it used to be North America and South America were not connected because the water levels were too high. Then the water levels fall. And so then this land emerges. And so originally you had different populations or you had, excuse me, one, you know, kind of big population or a couple big populations of these snapping shrimp. And these are really cool. These are things that they, they like, it's like popping your knuckles. They like pop bubbles. Um, but at a supersonic speed to make these really loud snapping sounds that they used to communicate. Anyway, you know, originally when the isthmus was not there, you just had these big populations and they could all, you know, have gene flow and interbreed. But then as the isthmus rose, the water, water levels fell and the isthmus began to block them. Now they're in different places. You've separated a couple of these groups and now gene flow cannot occur between them. They each diverge genetically. And so now you've got different species on either side of the isthmus because they were in different spots. And so the species formed in different places. That's allopatric. And so that's pretty easy to imagine, right? If two species are physically separate, they can exchange DNA. That's pretty easy to, to imagine. But how can you get a genetically unique group if they're not physically separated? If they're in the same spot, how can one get genetically isolated to where they diverge to form a new species? How can you get sympatric speciation? Well, it's not as common, but we do see it. And a good example um, are polyploid events. And so again, um, you know, polyploidy is when you have multiple copies of the entire genome, not just one extra chromosome or two extra chromosomes, but a complete extra copy of the chromosomes. And here I'm holding the salmon and the family Salmonidae is a good example. The salmon have exactly twice as many chromosomes as their nearest relative, which are the smelts. And so the most likely explanation is that they, they evolved sympatrically with the smelts. So, you know, you've got a group of smelts, but then in one small group, there was some individuals or some, you know, an individual that had an error during mitosis or meiosis such that their chromosomes didn't get split up, probably during meiosis. And so if the chromosomes didn't get split up, then the gametes have twice as much DNA as they're supposed to. And if those organisms, you know, uh, so if you had one fish that did this, but that fish, of course, has thousands and thousands of babies, then the males and the females, you know, siblings all have this double chromosome. They, none of them can breed with any of the other smelts that are out there because they've got twice as many, as much chromosomes as all the other smelts. However, they can breed with one another because they've got the same number of chromosomes with their siblings. And so they just exchange DNA and they, they, bond with their siblings, and of course then their offspring also have this double chromosome number, and there you go. Now you've got a whole different species, and you didn't have to isolate them physically, it just happened because of an error during cellular division. Again, probably meiosis. And so again, we call this polyploidy, when you have an error that causes a doubling of the chromosomes, um, and you're no longer compatible with the original species, but you are compatible with your siblings. And so you start breeding with them. And then over a long period of time, you, you have this whole new species that evolved in the same place, sympatric. 
well this is much more common in plants than in animals you know so i gave you an animal example because this is zoology but it's much more common in plants and that's because um, plants can reproduce asexually very easily so lots of plants can just send off you know part of their root you know send off a runner or a tuber or a rhizome and then a new stem arrive from that and then they can send off another one so they can they can make more individuals without sexual reproduction you know a piece of the plant can break off and make roots and now you've got a whole other plant and also many plants can sexually reproduce with themselves they can have self-fertilization and so because of that if you have an odd chromosome number you can still make lots of individuals and those individuals will all have the same chromosome number and so they can start breeding with one another and you can get a whole different species and so presumably like this is how we think we got modern wheat right you're familiar with wheat we make bread and flour out of it and everything but if you look at the dna of wheat and compare it to other similar plants you can figure out how that wheat became a new species and so let's walk through this this chart here so you start with a couple of different species in the genus uh, triticum uh, triticum monococcum mo monococcum and wild triticum okay and each of those have 14 chromosomes and at some point they crossed and formed a viable but sterile offspring and so they have a hybrid that's sterile because again that's what species do right if you're different species you can't produce viable fertile offspring but you you know like you see examples with a mule or whatever where you can produce viable offspring but they're not fertile so you got this sterile hybrid and it's going to have 14 chromosomes just like each of its parents okay so the hybrid is sterile so how does it stick around why does it not just go extinct because plants can reproduce asexually and can also self-fertilize and this thing's got 14 chromosomes so it can produce gametes and those gametes you know can produce with other gametes that the plant produces because you've got an even number of chromosomes and you can produce asexually so you can get lots of individuals you can get a colony you can get a population of this hybrid that sticks around just because of you know plants are a little different sometimes than animals not sometimes all the time okay well so that goes on for a while at some point there's an error that occurs during meiosis again probably meiosis and maybe it was non-disjunction of all the chromosomes during meiosis one so think back to meiosis and how the chromosomes split up you remember non-disjunction is when the homologous chromosomes do not get separated homologous chromosomes should get separated in meiosis one but if there's an error and they don't and the whole chromosome set goes through non-disjunction so again maybe the mitotic spindle was disrupted and didn't pull you know there's lots of ways this could happen um, or maybe it was failure of cytokinesis at the end of meiosis one or the failure of cytokinesis at the end of, of meiosis two right instead of the cell pinching in half and each half having half as much dna the cell does not pinch in half and so now the remaining cell has twice as much dna something happened to double those chromosomes okay so now this plant again can't breed with any others because it's got double the dna but it can breed with itself because plants can do that right and it can reproduce itself asexually because plants can do that so you can get a lot of these and this new species is going to have 28 chromosomes because the you know the parent species the hybrid had 14 chromosomes you've got an error that doubles the chromosomes now you've got 28. so you've got a plant that's got 28 chromosomes it can't breed with any of the other plants out there it can breed with itself you've got a new species and so we call that new species a uh, triticum turgidum and uh that's sympatric speciation it didn't have to go and sit and be isolated from the other plants you just had a genetic error okay so now you've got this new species that's got 28 chromosomes and at some point again it bred with a different species 
Uh, so it bred with a uh, Triticum tauchii, and that species only had 14 chromosomes. So again, you've got two different species. When they breed, they can't produce a fertile offspring, but they can produce a viable offspring. And so you've got a sterile hybrid again. But again, the sterile hybrid can stick around and you can get more individuals because of asexual reproduction. Now, how many chromosomes would this hybrid have? Take a second and see if you can figure out how many chromosomes this new sterile hybrid would have when Turgidum crosses with Tauchii. Giving you time to pause the video, see if you can work this out. Okay, well, the diploid number for Turgidum is 28, so its haploid number is 14. So the gametes from Turgidum would have 14 chromosomes. The diploid number for Tauchii is 14, so its gametes, its haploid number is 7, so each gamete would have 7 chromosomes. And so when those gametes come together, the hybrid would have 14 plus 7, would have 21 chromosomes. And so that's the diploid number for this new sterile hybrid, right? Well, we're back to that problem we had before. Um, you got an odd number of chromosomes. You got an odd number of chromosomes, you can't produce good gametes because you can't equally partition out the DNA during meiosis because you got an odd number. Just like happens in the mule, right? The mule's got an odd number of chromosomes. And so you've got a viable offspring that can't produce gametes because the chromosomes are messed up. But it can still make copies of itself asexually. And then, again, you have another, at some point, you have another meiotic error that doubles the chromosomes. And so you've got this sterile hybrid with 21 chromosomes that now has double the DNA. It's got 42 chromosomes. We're back to an even number, right? And so this new uh, plant that was formed from the polyploid event uh, can reproduce asexually, but since it's got an even number of chromosomes, it can also self-fertilize, but it can't reproduce with any other species out there. And so, boom, you got a new species, and that new species is uh, Triticum estivium, or modern wheat. And it's got 42 chromosomes, and it's a new species, but it didn't have to be isolated. It just happened due, due to meiotic error. That's sympatric speciation. Okay, so that was a, a long explanation, but I think it's important because it starts to tie all these things together that we've been learning about. Um, and so, again, we could talk forever and ever about how new species are formed, but these, this is the basic idea. You've got to isolate a group genetically, and so then that group can breed with itself, but none others, you've got a new species. Um, so great. So let me know if you've got any questions. That's all I've got here. I'll talk to you later. See ya.